everybody. Welcome to episode 12 of Brownbent Horrors Behind the Horror. We are here today with the cast and crew of the awesome, awesome flick starring a former Power Ranger, Blood Punch. So, yeah, I had to throw that in, the Power Ranger thing. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> We're going to say hello to our director, Miss Madeline Paxson, top left-hand corner of your screen there. And then bottom left-hand screen, we've got Mr. Milo Cawthorn. Say hello, Milo. Hello, how you doing? And then our wonderful writer, Mr. Eddie Gazillion. Man with a gazillion ideas. How many times have you heard that? <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say a gazillion, but... A gazillion, right. Okay. <laughs> I promise my jokes don't get better. All right. So, everybody, thank you so much for being here. We want to give a big shout out to Miss Sherry Flaherty over at Midnight Releasing and Samara Entertainment for hooking us all up together. Um, once again, to check out an awesome film, which I love doing because I had to pay for it, and uh, getting to chat with cast and crew and have some content that I'm still getting paid for. Okay, so, no, it's a joke. I told you they don't get better. Okay, um, enough of the shtick. So, anybody who's watched any of our previous episodes, which hopefully you have, after our introductions, which we're going to go around the room here, we're going to get into a little horror trivia. So first and foremost, we'd like to talk to our wonderful director who made, this is a violent film. Um, there, there's so many kills in this movie um, and there's only three people in it. So, uh, so if anybody keeps record of how many on-screen kills are in their horror flicks, um, this one you might need to get out like a legal pad or, you know, some kind of long loose leaf paper to do that. So, uh, Miss Madeline Paxson, our director, tell us who you are and how you got involved with Blood Punch. Well, my name is Madeline Paxson. I'm the director of Blood Punch, but uh, long before I was director of Blood Punch, uh, Eddie and I, who is the writer of Blood Punch, uh, we were both cartoon writers that we met at Disney. Uh, I'm actually in Burbank right now. Uh, we got married, we met, got married. And, you know, we were cartoon writers, but we always wanted and we talked about like, oh, we should make our own movie, make our own movie. And eventually the cost of production just came down so much um, that it became actually possible, which is now why everybody's making a movie, right? Um, I made one this morning. <laughs> I'm telling you it's it's a lot easier now it doesn't mean that it's easy it's just a lot easier and definitely cheaper uh but when you but, write when you write in kids tv or children's entertainment like if you work on winnie the pooh long enough you build up a lot of rage inside yeah but i think and, and, but i think translated to those like you're asking about the kills and the number of kills i think there was definitely an outlet for all of the years of like children's entertainment that Maddie and I worked on that kind of came out. I mean, out you wanted little... Pooh and Tigger to bite the dust so many times <laughs> on so many days. Um, I totally get it. Go ahead, Madeline. You were saying? Oh yeah, that, I mean, he's pretty much told you how we ended up at Blood Punch, but not entirely because, you know, he, he I know we haven't gotten to him yet, but um well, it's a great gotten... segue. We could go straight to Eddie at this point. <laughs> right. Here, let me just well, we, quickly well, we... just tell you, and then we can move to him. Gotcha. But he got, you know, we were both working at Disney. He got a job as EP of a season of Power Rangers, which was shooting in New Zealand. And, you know, I'm a writer, so he hired, of course, we help each other with everything. And I was, I wrote on it also. But we met these, these actors there that were freaking awesome. And in kids TV, especially live action kids TV, you do not see that. You that's don't get a Jason thing. David Frank every day. That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, Milo, what about that, man? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you can move to Eddie now if you <laughs> if you like. No, so anyway, we just had met these actors and we thought, you know, we'd like to work with these guys again. Also, we'd like to make a movie. Also, it's cheaper to make a movie now. Let's make a movie, guys. Right on. And then over to Eddie. Eddie's like, heck yeah, I want to make a movie. I want to put some kills in it. Tell us no, about it, Matt, Mr. Mr. Eddie well, but, uh, Gazillion. 
But Maddie's right. I mean, we'd always wanted to do a movie, but one of the things that I think made it also feel possible is that it was meeting the actors or getting a chance to work with the actors. Because, I mean, we wrote the script with them in mind. Like, uh, and it's a big advantage to all, like when writing a script to know the actor you have in mind and know that like there are actors that you trust with giving this role. Like it, it helped a lot to make the project just more real for Maddie and I, or more, or it felt a little less intimidating knowing that we had actors that we had a lot of trust and faith in that we knew could pull it off and that we wrote the, the script and tailored the characters just for that. So yeah, the Power Rangers thing was a, was a big uh, thing for us because it, yeah, it was cast entirely out of New Zealand and Australia. And we got a chance to meet these actors. They're, they were great. They, they, they were great on Power Rangers, but we kind of, like when that finished, wanted to work with them more. And so it, it kind of naturally turned into Blood Bunch. So one thing I've noticed about a lot of the films that we've reviewed and talked about and had on the show is that a lot of the writers and directors love to try to keep like a core group around them of people that they want to work with. Like when you, when you find people that click, you do anything you can to keep those same like core group of people clicked around you. Um, we see that with just about every one that we've, uh, we've talked to, um, which I'm guessing is why this gentleman is in the bottom left-hand corner of my screen today. Mr. Milo Cawthorn of Power Rangers RPM fame and blood, more importantly, Blood Punch, because Blood Punch was freaking awesome, uh, which is the reason why we're talking here today. So, Milo, tell us how you got involved with this. Obviously, it was because of Power Rangers, but what did you think when they were like, man, we want you to be in this uh, flick, and here's what it's about? It was uh, truly a dream come true moment. It's very rare that you will get an email from someone who you respect and admire and it says, hey, we'd love you to be in this film. Come over to another country, we're going to film it. it. It felt unreal when I first read it. Uh, because you get you get some emails like that of people who you're like, man, this script is trash. <laughs> but to, to, to get this email and to read, I think it was, it was a short, it was like a short kind of trailerized version. Am I right, Eddie? When you first sent me the script, it wasn't, it wasn't the full Yeah, I think thing. it was like the opening and then a couple other little like, that, like things to to try to like trick you into thinking that the rest of it could also be <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but no it was I think it was the opening scene and then like a little bit of like a teaser thing of what we had in mind yeah and it was it was amazing so there was it was just no questions asked myself and my partner at the time Liv were just like let's do it it's Liv who plays Skylar I also I should mention that I wouldn't have been on Power Rangers if it wasn't for Eddie and Maddie because the casting director didn't put me in her like top 10 picks. And so Eddie had to be like, oh, I want to see like the other tapes. And she was kind of a bit hesitant to let him see the other tapes. And then he saw mine. And so thank God for that, because that got me through to the recalls. And really it was, it was due to Eddie uh, putting his foot down <laughs> that I was a Power Ranger. So <laughs> well, really. he's a Power Ranger, damn it. We're going to have him on this movie. <laughs> Well, well, Milo's audition for Power Rangers, it might be one of my favorite pieces of media that I've ever consumed. <laughs> is it circulating somewhere? Is that something I, we can find? I, I, th I think at some point we gave it away as like a special features thing on, on Blood Punch, I feel like. So it may be out there. Like, if not, I'll send, I'll, I'll definitely send you a copy. Um, but it's, it's, inc it's incredible. Like, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And Everything I was just... Was the, okay. the casting director was called Terry Diath, but it was spelt death. And she was <laughs> notorious in, in New Zealand for people really found her uncomfortable. She was very harsh. Oh, that's she amazing. Told me, she told me I look like a clown and I had to get a haircut. Um, and she's kind of like a well-known industry. She's retired now, but she was like a, a kind of like a dragon. Like people were afraid of going to Terry yeah. Diath. So I, was, I went in a little bit like, uh, this isn't going to go well. But you Little went in. You know, it was your big dream to be a clown. So <laughs> you went in, crushed it. Here we are, Nashville, Tennessee, talking about Blood Punch. Beautiful. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for being here once again, um, taking time out of your day. I know everybody's way more important than I am at this point and way, doing way more important things. Um, 
Thank you so much. Um, we're going to get right into a little bit of trivia. And the way it works is, um, obviously, I ask you a question, you have to answer. Um, so the first one to 300 points wins. Each question is worth 100 points. Um, if you want to answer, all you do is throw up your hand, and then I'll call on you. First one to 300 points wins, or until we get basically it's sick and tired of it, and we quit asking questions. So are we ready? Is everybody a horror fan? Because this is the biggest horror fan here. This is Trivial Pursuit's actual horror deck here. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I should I shouldn't have said anything because now it's oh, the, yeah, it's really. only humiliation if I lose. <laughs> right. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Question one of the trivia section: What director helmed both The Bride of Frankenstein in 1935 and Frankenstein in 1931? I don't even know this. Bad question. <laughs> Anybody know it? We don't no. get it. <laughs> I, I'm, it might sound familiar when I hear it, but I can't come up with it. Okay, we're going to skip that question. It was James <laughs> Whale. Let me check, let me Wait, check IMDb. I would, right. not have got, I, I would not have gotten that. <laughs> okay, we're going to go with a yeah, little dude. bit more of a recent question here. Um... If Universal hadn't killed their whole extended monsters universe, people God, might know people right? might know that name. They might know that <laughs> that name from Frankenstein. Okay. What type of animal is Black Phillip in The Witch from 2015? <laughs> Eddie is gonna take a shot in the dark here. I'm gonna go with a cat. I'm gonna say it's not a trick question. Eddie is says it? it's a cat, and it is 100 percent not a cat. Ah. Uh. You may want to pick up this first 100 points. All right, someone else has to take a stab. I feel like Black Phillip. Black Phillip sounds like a horse to me. Oh, we're getting closer, but it's not a horse. (laughs) Madeline, you want to to take another shot at a possible farm animal that could be Black Phillip? (laughs) Pig. Pig. Black pig. You got black pigs on your farm up there in Burbank? No, no. Black (laughs) Phillip is a goat. Okay, so are we all at, uh, are we all at minus a hundred now? Is that how no, this it's works? Not like, like, it's not gonna, like Jeopardy. We're gonna owe you money. Okay, <laughs> those are just gauging questions, just to kind of sure. see how we actually are. So I'm gonna come up with sure. ones that are off the top of my head <laughs> that everybody will be able to get, and we want to move right into talking about the movie. Okay, I like that J- JC has lost complete faith in us. <laughs> <laughs> as well he should oh man trivial pursuit deck and he's just going for like okay the... okay so in the movie halloween in 1978 who plays the role of michael's doctor dr sam loomis eddie for 100 points uh, Donald Pleasance. 100 points to Mr. Eddie oh. Gazillion. Uh, and it's, it's, is it, or is it, is it Sir Donald Pleasance? Did they ever do the right thing and, and knight that gentleman or no? I don't think they did. They sh- I don't think he got the same treatment as Elton John. Yeah, that's, that's not right. He should have. He from should a cinematic have. standpoint, he was the Elton John of cinema for sure. For, for Halloween and Escape from New York alone. Oh, yeah. Oh, and he was also in, uh, what, The Great Escape? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was great. In The Great Escape, he was the forger. And he was what? Was he a was he a Bond villain? Yes, I think he made Bond it, villain. Only, I think at some you point. only I think from you only lived twice. Man, separate conversation happening I here, think. folks. Here we go. Yeah, well, can All we right. can we switch this to Bond trivia? Maybe I'll do better. Right. In Goldeneye. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay. In the 1996 film Scream, directed by this deceased director. It stars Nev Campbell being attacked by a killer, which turns out to be her boyfriend. Who was that director? Director of Scream. Uh, well, I mean, Matt, Eddie, uh, give us a shot. Uh, Wes Craven. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say. 100%. Craven. Wes Craven. 200 points. Because he already died. <sighs> Eddie's about yeah, to just steal recently, it. Just recently, just a couple of years ago. And our yeah. friend was his assistant, wasn't he? Yeah, Dave Dave Baden, Dave if you're Baden. out there. <laughs> name drop Eddie's name dropping. Okay. Um last uh, well maybe the last question. 
Maybe the last question. Um, <laughs> just give it to Eddie. Just give it to it, right. Uh, let's go. Uh, okay. Who played the role of Pennywise the Dancing Clown in the 1990 miniseries It? Oh, I... Oh, you raised your hand, Madeline. You got to answer. Was it... God damn it. I can't remember his name. Oh, I swore. I'm sorry. Apologies. Yeah, we're demonetized. <laughs> no, it's... We don't Thanks care about Because of Matt. Just, just send Maddie a bill for whatever... Well, I can't remember Whatever his name, Eddie. You, you tell me. You, you know say his name. it. You know. His I name. can't. Rem- I literally cannot remember his name. But he uh, was. Oh. I Wait know. What, he was the famous transvestite in. Yes. Uh, yes. And, yes. And he was in Legend. In Legend. I adore him, but I he can't remember the, his name. Milo, Legend. where are you at, man? You're over there looking like uh, the, he was the kid. Oh. He was the butler in Clue. Come on, Milo. You got to. You're quit. giving him like an early reference. Milo, you got to quit acting like you're auditioning for Into the Wild over there, okay? And he was in Legend, which I loved him in, too. Was he in one of the Harry Potter movies? I feel like he's, he should have been. He should have been, not. but I don't know if he was. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, I just have a terrible memory, but I know the actor and I love him. I just can't remember his name. All right, should I, should I, should I just Yeah, take just go it ahead. Okay. Just take it. Speaking just take of... It. Uh, Speaking of people who should have probably been knighted, Mr. Tim Curry. Tim Curry. Tim Curry. Big man. So, Eddie is the horror trivia champion tonight. We can just edit out that Black Phillip thing, right? No one's ever going to see that? No, we're definitely <laughs> leaving that in. Uh, he, so, Black Phillip was a pig, he was a horse, <laughs> and he was a cat. <laughs> he was exactly. really a goat. <laughs> Oh man. So, well, let's talk Blood Punch. Let's talk. Let's talk about the film that was the winner at the New Orleans Horror Film Festival. Let's talk that movie for a little bit, shall we? Winner at the New Orleans Horror Film Festival, um, starring starring Milo Cawthorn, um, <laughs> written by some Disney writers. So, <laughs> listen, guys. So I am DB'd the movie first, saw that you guys were Disney writers, and then watched the movie, and everything made sense. <laughs> I swear it did. I swear. Um, it had like a tone to it that if you took out the violence and changed it from live action to an- animation, I could totally have seen it. <laughs> but it kept me interested the entire time. So if you keep me interested, you know, hey, you did something. Okay, so we've got, um, I made some notes here. So we're going to start with, so the opening scene is basically uh, Milo talking into a camera and then like his other self is watching it. And then... uh if nobody likes spoilers, uh, you can disregard this part. Milo chops his fingers off, and then he wakes up, and here we are. Um, so, once again, don't want to talk about the entire flick. We want everybody to be a surprise, just like it was to us, or just was to me. Um, this is pre-Happy Death Day, people. So, But this is after Groundhog Day, so that gives you a little bit of insight of kind of where we're at. Milo, let's just start with you, buddy. What was one of your favorite scenes in this flick to shoot? What What, what do you remember from shooting? <laughs> I'm going to say that he probably doesn't remember anything because this was like 10 years ago, right, Milo? <laughs> I have I have one of my greatest memories. I mean, there's lots of great memories. but my Oh, favorite forgive one, me, I'm sorry. Even... <laughs> I forgot this was 2015. You guys probably shot it a couple years before that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a while ago. Well, just pretend but, like I didn't say that. <laughs> but one of my favorite scenes, I wasn't even in, uh, the character played by Ari Boyland, he dies many times in this film. And so one of the things where we're setting up for a shot where he's supposed to just be getting bullets, just like boom, 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 boom. And so we, we padded him up and Eddie has a paintball gun and Eddie's like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna aim for the torso, no worries. And, and Eddie's a pretty good shot. So everyone's like, okay, sweet. And Eddie's got like maybe six or seven bullets in there. They're just gonna, and Ari just has to like kind of, kind of steal the hits a bit. 
And so we pad up and we shoot and I'm behind the camera looking at this and it's, we, we start rolling and it's going well. And, and Ari's like selling, he's like, ah, 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 like uh, is, we're about four shots in. And then one stray bullet, just <laughs> it hits like right there. There's no padding and it's this real sensitive, like tender bit of skin. And oh my God. I, I just, remember, <laughs> but I just remember the day, the difference between Ari like acting hurt and then suddenly, when one actually does hit him, the, the, his the, oh, it's so good. He's like ah ah, and he's like ah ah, and uh, but we're only like halfway through the shot, so he has to he has to keep going. He's he got to milk he it. Can't, like break character, yeah. So it listen to this. So, <laughs> so <laughs> funny to me, and it remains one of my greatest memories. <laughs> yeah, watching the watching that take on dailies like frame by frame, it is just it is exactly the way like Milo is saying like God God bless him. Ari's like like acting like he's getting killed is just like this, and then suddenly he's like ow, 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 like that like like and then and then and then quickly goes back to dying. Like listen, paintballs are no joke. No, no, and I, I do have to say I did give Ari the chance uh, to shoot me back later in the production, uh, so we're even. I, as far as I'm concerned, we're even. <laughs> As far as you're concerned, he's still yeah, like in the shadows. <laughs> I was uh, one of my first jobs moving up to the Nashville area was working for a uh, haunted house, which I don't know if you guys call them haunted houses where you're at in Burbank, California, but you know, people dress up, try to scare you. Um, but we had a haunted, um, we had kind of like a carnival kind of thing out in front of it. And I dressed up as a zombie and people could pay to uh shoot me with a paintball gun jesus so what did you uh, have on for padding what, were, what was your padding situation well hold on there hold on there let me let me just paint this picture for you okay so you could hear about my even with my nasal congestion here you could still hear the southern draw we're not in you know we're, we're in the south okay nashville tennessee um there's people out here who have real guns we have real guns okay so when somebody picks up this paintball gun um it's odd and if you're a male because men men will will agree with this and you're handing someone a paintball gun and you're like here man you could pay 10 bucks and shoot this guy 20 times man <laughs> you're automatically aiming for his nuts <laughs> go to every time right okay right so luckily i had a cup on along with a lot of other padding um but I was wearing, I used to wear this, I had to wear this, uh, uh, it was a motorcycle helmet with a kind of like a trick-or-treat studios latex kind of mask that had been adhered to it. So maybe look more zombified. The helmet. So it was over the helmet. Right. But the first shot I took, I could not see anything. Right. <laughs> so, you know, people are paying multiple times in a row <laughs> so for anywhere three to five minutes i'm walking out in front of this little area you know how like you you shoot the gun and the ducks are going by yeah and the guy the shooting gallery kind yeah of that's basically what i was and i was completely blinded so after the first shot i was just kind of walking back and forth and trying to duck down and there was nothing to duck down and people were just laying into me so you had more than one going at once it was like a, whoever pays just lines up and it was like a firing squad <laughs> Uh, something like that, you could say. Yeah, a a yeah, it's firing squad. Yeah. How did much total money? Line? Yeah, or uh, how, how much total money did you pull in? Uh, I think it was like fifty bucks a weekend. Oh, that's not bad. No, hey, not too bad for down here in Nashville. Okay. How many females paid to do that? Like, oh, so, they loved it. They they would they, get, so they they would get up, their picture made afterward. They like stepped they, up. They too. ate it up. Yeah, and people loved it. Um. I how long did you have this job for? Uh, we ran it for September and October. And I did you've it, you know. Us, you've just given us an idea for Halloween. Yeah, see, Matt, <laughs> Maddie, and I, Maddie and I are very into haunted houses, like setting up our, our house on Halloween. And, you know, it's, it's funny, but, but not, no joke. Like, we always talked about the movie it, it, not in the same sort of thing of, like, that feeling we would see on people's faces when they would come up our driveway Halloween and we had set something up. And that's that feeling on their faces. That's sort of what we were trying to get as a reaction from Blood Punch. Like we, but but Maddie and I talked about that quite a bit. How there was something so pure about 
that reaction. It was like a surprise first. It's like, oh, wow, there's a Halloween, something happening at this house. Let's go. And then the delight of like, wow, this is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. So yeah. that's and, and what there was we're something, going for with Blood Punch. And there was something pure about like, there was no, you know, we, we, there was no, we didn't have anything to gain by set, like setting up all this stuff. It was purely just to entertain people that came by. And there was something kind of really nice about that. So I think we, we, we tried to have that in mind when we made the movie of like, can we just try to stick to that pure thing of like getting a reaction that, that, that really like wows people or. Well, let me ask you this, since we're, since we're talking about your film, Blood Punch. Um, so Eddie, you're the writer, Madeline, you directed, but I'm sure you guys kind of like co-wrote and like filled each other in and stuff like that. Um, how did the, how did the idea of blood punch kind of come together? Well, I'll just Eddie, I'll let Eddie take the heavy lifting on the writing part, but I will say this, it, a lot of it was reverse engineered because we started with, okay, we have a budget. We're, we're financing this ourselves completely. We have, what do we have? We have, we have actors. We have three actors. We, we had a few more, you know, I mean, cause there's five of the actors came from blood from power Rangers. So, Nice. Three Rangers, uh, the villainous Adelaide Kane, and from Power, Power Rangers and uh, Liv, who was like the mentor. But so we had those four. Oh, look, I hear the dog. Yay. Uh, Sadie, hush. Okay. So we st this is what we had. And then we thought, well, what can we do with the money that we have and these actors? So then go ahead, Eddie, if you want to keep adding. Um, no, but I think Matt is right. And like, I think when you're, when you make your own movie or you do make something low budget like that, like you do have to start with like, what are our constraints or like what, you know, what, what, and, and then within those constraints, you can challenge yourself to be extra creative and really, and really go the extra mile. But you do have to kind of take into account, you know, what can we afford to do? What can we pull off? And when you, when you know those constraints, I think you can really rise to the occasion of like being creative to work within that framework and come up with really like surprising ways to make that stuff, the stuff you can't do, not be a, uh, to be an advantage, not like a, a thing. So I think, I think Matt is really right though, that to some extent it, very early on, it was saying, what, what do we have to work with here? And then what we, can we do within that? Like, and what uh, do we like? What are the things we actually really like that we think we can do? Uh, um, but, you know, but, but, we didn't want to do like a, a found footage or something like that which is, you know, easy. You want it to be inexpensive, but you didn't want to take the easy way out. Right. We want to do, you know, we're film buffs. We love real movies. We, with editing and, you know, sounds, a score, soundtrack and twists and turns and all that stuff and action and violence. So to the extent Good that- Good all-American fun. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Um, so, with but, a bunch of Kiwis. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but the but the initial kernel of the of the idea, it was actually like my twenty first birthday. I was uh, studying in, uh, in London abroad, and I I my roommates had taken me out, and I I got so drunk. I had I had a but I had a final the next day, and so I remember like that being a thing in my mind of hey, no matter what happens, I have to remember to get up and uh, and do this final. And it's like I think I mentioned it to my some of my roommates. So I woke up like five in the morning incredibly hungover didn't remember a lot and remember but remembered that final and i i stumbled found a piece of paper and wrote myself a note to or, or wrote a note to my roommates to go leave in the hall that just said hey if i'm not up by this time please please wake me up and when i went to put the note in the hall there was already a note sitting on the floor of the hallway in my handwriting saying like pretty much word for word the exact same note i had just written and it was the creepiest feeling I've ever had. It was the most like profoundly creepy feeling. And I, cause I had no memory of writing the note or leaving it there, but you looked at it and it was in, unquestionably in my handwriting. That's killer. And, and, and just the feeling that sinking feeling that I got when I, it, you know, it really did feel like there was another doppelganger me walking around somewhere doing stuff. And I, and that really always stuck with me as, you know, as far as like things that have creeped me out, there's pl plenty of movie things mm -hmm but not a lot of real life things that have really creeped me out. And that moment really stuck with me as being like profoundly creepy. 
Oh man, so, nothing like a little uh, real life scenario to hit home on something like that. That's yeah, it always awesome. stuck with it always stuck with me because it was years and years later, uh, you know, twenty years later that I wrote Blood Punch, but that always stuck with me. Wow, that's man, that's amazing. I'll share a quick story with you. Don't have too many. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this on another episode, but I had this. I had a story I was working on, and it it stemmed from uh, my mother bought this ventriloquist dummy when I was a oh, kid. God, that, that's creepy right there. You can <laughs> stop. You can stop right there. I just go ahead and stop. All right, Milo, we'll hear from you. Uh, that's creepy so, as hell. My mother bought this ventriloquist dummy. It was the classic one, dressed in a tux. Got the. It looked straight out of uh, Goosebumps. And uh, bought it from a thrift store, and that thing used to we had a three story home at the time and uh that thing used to beat people down the stairs and be sitting in the <laughs> living room multiple occasions people in and friends and family have come over and attested to this and uh <clears throat> but see, but see the first time that happened that that would be in, that would be the house that i used to live in <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it, 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 like, right exactly 100%. i'd just be gone like if it was sitting in the bottom of the stairs I, that's it like so, i turn around classic and I, ne horror I, movie never thing. I never look back i never look back one more one more and then i want to ask uh, milo wait, a question wait, wait, wait did anyone ever confess to being the one who was behind it like who like did well it no uh so so i grew up uh mom was single um just me and my brother and my brother at the time was working so he was never home so or he wanted you to think that, but he's right. Back and well, put, put one more, one more on story. Well, I have a story that can kind of corroborate kind of the weirdness. My mother really loved uh, messing around with a Ouija board too. Uh, she used to have a friend come over. So I don't know if uh, anything like that had anything to do with it. I do know that I had a Buzz Lightyear that was behind the couch one time. It became it, a thunderstorm. Worse, it was a crazy storm happening. I was being babysat by uh, one of her friends. And then all of a sudden, damn Buzz Lightyear starts talking behind the behind the couch, not being pressed. Oh, like to infinity and beyond? Like it was but multiple kind of, multiple catchphrases, all that. Slow, it was slowed down and creepy, kind of like <laughs> to infinity and beyond. Not quite as cool. <laughs> not quite as cool. Um I attribute it, I, I did attribute that to possible battery battery drainage or something like that. So what you're describing is so cinematic though. It's like I can see the Ouija board and there's lightning <laughs> and the next flash of lightning suddenly illuminates uh, a buzz light ear. You guys, I have a great idea though. I, this has given me a great idea for a product that's gonna make us all rich. Uh Okay, so for Halloween, we'll create this for as a thing we sell for Halloween. And I'm deadly serious, all right. This is not a joke. You've heard of Elf on a Shelf, right? So we make some version of that oh. to sell. Cut, cut, cut the feed. We have to patent this. I mean, <laughs> you can't use Buzz Lightyear because that's, you know, Disney property, but it could be like Buzz on a whatever that rhymes with Buzz. Um, no, it's, yeah, it's I'm deadly be, serious. This would be a brilliant yeah. thing to sell for Halloween. It's going to be something that rhymes. It's like goblin on an oven or something like that dead on just, the bed it just rhyme. dead on the bed i like that i could see that you put, the everybody... little, you put the little doll in like various poses or like you know being hung in a closet or something but i wonder if a if a, a ventriloquist dummy would actually be the best thing to use just like you said and just that right. you sell that as a thing Kid, parents could put around like they do with Elf on a Shelf, which I, I'm guessing because I've never done it. What about just they a horror film centered around Elf on a Shelf and like how they're <laughs> completely demonic? Oh my God, that's this brilliant is a, too. This is, this is a true we story. Need... I got called into for a holiday special. Somebody invented something for Hanukkah instead of Elf on a Shelf that was mensch on a bench. <laughs> so, 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 because I think I had done holiday specials in the past. They were bringing me in to pitch on this. <laughs> and I had said to them, I had explained to them like, oh, you know, that sounds interesting. I, you know, you should know I'm not, I'm not Jewish. Like, uh, you know, I was great. And they were just like, oh, really? And they seemed kind of disappointed, but they were like, okay, well, that's all right. Your name's not and Eddie then, Feinstein? And then they were going to have me come and meet the guy who invented uh, Mensch on a Bench. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'd love to meet him. You know, you should probably tell him I'm not Jewish. 
explain, you know, I'm not actually Jewish before we meet him. So I go in the meeting, we meet, sit down. The first thing he says is, as I sure you know from growing up, Hanukkah is a special time for, <laughs> for your family as it was in my, for my family. And I, had to, <laughs> and I had to kind of be like, I'm, oh no, I'm actually not Jewish. And he just looked around the room like, what is this guy doing here? <laughs> why are you here? Yeah, like why, why is this, 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 why would you bring this writer in? Uh, wow. I'm, so, I'm sorry, but you're right. It's okay. Milo, how was it, you know, now that we know that Eddie was Jewish, uh, Milo, how was it like <laughs> growing up in Jamaica, man? <laughs> well, we didn't have, we didn't, I tell you what, we didn't have Elf on a Shelf in Jamaica or New Zealand. What is Elf? What's the point of what's the idea behind Elf on a Shelf? It's so Elf creepy. on the Shelf is basically, you, you give it to a kid, it's a little elf, and you like, you put it in various poses whenever they go to sleep, and when they wake up, they see like, Maybe it's, you know, been moved or, you know, maybe it's opened up a cookie jar or something like but, that. But, but correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there some element to it that it's also, it's watching you? There's, Hell something yeah. creepy, there's something creepy about it. Like it's watching you. It knows if you've done things or whatever. It's Santa's and, Alexa. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's like Santa's little snitch. Yeah. It's like planted <laughs> in your house. You about said it the other way. Dude. That was a true way. <laughs> Anyways uh milo new zealand were you were you living in new zealand whenever they were filming lord of the rings uh yeah did you get any uh extra no what the hell i'm still mad about it to this day <laughs> that fucking peter jackson man i swear him and his uh award-winning films Anyways, we're uh, talking about Blood Punch, which is also well, an award-winning film. Uh, beyond uh, well, the I winner, think Ol Olivia Tennant, who played uh, Skylar, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't she in the second? Was it the second Lord? Two of Towers. She was in Two Towers. What? What? Well, she was like four at the time, I think. <laughs> but like, I think she's like the the uh, Liv Tyler character helps her on a horse or rescues her and puts her on a horse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's like a villager oh, getting. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So she's like oh, a she's picture. a Rohan villager. All right, so check this out real quick. Let's go back. Let's go go to the film for one sec. I oh, want to talk you... about the uh, the oh, scene. When you, I'm sorry. When you said the film, I honestly thought you meant the two towers. Yeah, the two towers. <laughs> we're gonna to that. You know, Legolas does the whole skateboarding thing down the stairs. Uh, no, we're gonna talk about your film, Blood okay. Punch. Great. Uh, the group therapy session. Where Skyler is just like going off the ha off the handle to like everybody, and you know there was like references to like some sexual maneuvers and like all this that and the other. Um, where I just want to know something: where is the doctor or the mediator for that uh, group therapy session at that allows that to just keep happening? I, I can answer this question. Where's all the adults in this place? I can answer that that question under the the rule of. Uh, so in original drafts of the script, I had done a lot of and a lot of research into kind of rehab facilities, how they're run. And in the original drafts of the script, it was much more accurate, but it took so much time to set that up and none of it was interesting. So like the so so at some point, and I think we did this uh, throughout the movie, which you know, it, I'm not sure if it was necessarily the right call, but there was a certain kind of general thing of just forget the logic of it. And just go with the kind of care the emotion of the characters you want to get and not not get too hung up but you're absolutely right that the facility is ridiculous it's un it doesn't really it's it's like a cross between summer camp and jail like it doesn't <laughs> yeah it doesn't, it doesn't actually fit any actual facility that exists like like it, it you know so so that i mean that's a good example of like we were aware of how not realistic it was and just kind of hoping people would kind of go along with it because like I said, I mean, I did, I did do a lot of research and a lot of time writing the scenes that it would have had to. Uh, oh, look at the puppy! No, <laughs> you got to get down. Oh. So the more realistic version just wouldn't have been as fun, and would have. So I, at some point, we were just like, no, let's just go. It, it doesn't make any sense, but let's just go with the fun version that gets us where we want to be story wise, and and which I think is one of the reasons I loved it because you. And don't you do that in movies that you love? You suspend, you know. <laughs> rational thought you know just yeah. like with titanic and rose's big ass on the door that was made for two we, <laughs> jack totally could have survived but no 
And I think no. we, always, we always felt like if, if you're emotionally on board, you'll forgive a movie a lot of logic flaws. Amen. 100%. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not emotionally on board, you notice everything. You notice every little mistake and, and stuff. But when you care and you're emotionally on board, there can be glaring plot holes and things that it doesn't bother you. So I think we were kind of hoping that we'd get people emotionally on board and they'd forgive us a lot of the logic things that don't make So sense. to piggyback on that real quick, can either the three of you, or even myself, can, can we throw a film out there that has an obvious plot hole? Toy Story. Yeah, speaking of Buzz Lightyear, this is something that- um, You never noticed, did you? <laughs> plot hole. I mean, I well, you know, I'm a simple man, okay? So I love my Toy Stories. So well, it, this, but this is the thing is I think they made the right choice in that movie to not address this or, it, you know, I don't consider it a flaw of the movie, but there is a, there is a kind of staggering uh, plot. Go ahead. Hit us with it. OK, if so, Buzz Lightyear doesn't know that he's a toy, right? Right. The beginning of Toy Story. But at, but we learn at some point that toys go limp when humans are around. Right. Towards the end of the movie to scare the neighbor kid, Sid, the toys decide, let's not go limp and let's kind of like move around in front of Sid to scare him. Right. And I think Woody makes a mention of something like, well, we might have to break a few rules to do that, kind of implying they're not supposed to do that, but they right. can't. So it's clear right. they can choose to not go limp and flop when humans are around. Given that's the case, why would Buzz not knowing he's a toy and actually insisting that he's not a toy, why would he go limp when Andy walks into a room? And I'll just, I'll just let that, I'll just let that sit there. <laughs> We're going to let that simmer. How about, that damn, how about that damn Chris Evans is going to play Buzz Lightyear? <laughs> um, Wait, what are you talking about? Is there going to be a live really? action? A live Seriously? action Toy it's, Story? It's or? supposed to be a live, a, it's, I don't know if it's live action per se. I think it's animated, but it's like uh, it's about the ast or it's about the space guy that Buzz Lightyear is based off of. Right. Okay. Uh, Disney's fishing guys. You need to talk uh, to your yeah. people. Yeah, they're Look, they've been doing that since we worked there. Trust me, they never saw a dollar they didn't like, so they will just <laughs> they will destroy everything you love to make a buck. No, but talk wow. about talk about creatively bankrupt, like. But so they've been talking, creatively bankrupt a really so, long time. So you're time. talking about an astronaut story that like the last scene of the of the movie is he's like an old man and he's like, God, I don't think anyone's going to even remember my career as an astronaut. And then you pan over to a toy story where they're stocking like Buzz Lightyear toys. And that's right. the movie. Like that's, that's it. <laughs> Holy shit. Is that the plot? I don't know. That's I'm just plot. saying like that, that it's, it's so funny that they would take a character and be like, invent a real life person that that toy was based on well hey as miss madeline stated it's all about starting from the ending like kind of working your way back <laughs> <laughs> okay so where are we at so so okay yeah buzz lightyear so buzz lightyear if he doesn't know he's a toy he wouldn't he wouldn't know to flop or go limp when Andy walks in the room. But but I have to say, like, I think the movie made the right decision to not try to explain that. It's a good example of you you don't care. You you love those characters, you're emotionally involved. You're not, you're not, you're not looking for like things to nitpick. It doesn't bother you. It also helps that it comes, you find out the rules about the Sid thing and coming to life late in the movie. So I think by the time you reach that point, you're so emotionally invested in Woody and Butt. Like you, you don't care at all that there's something that doesn't make and this sense. is something you know honestly eddie and i discussed for a, many 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 times of when coming up with blood punch and, and looking at the idea of what you and you could call it a plot hole it's not exactly that most every movie has a plot hole strictly speaking you just it's like a magic trick you try to distract away don't look at that look at this because this is the fun interesting part you know right so, so yeah, I don't fault Toy Story. I think they made the, the right decision to do that and not explain it and have it just not make sense because emotionally it just works beautifully. Well, besides um, still secretly working for Disney and writing their Buzz Lightyear story, what does Mr. <laughs> Eddie Gazillion have coming up here as far as future projects go? What are you working on? 
uh, we have a bunch of stuff in development and stuff that we're working on, stuff that we're trying to get financed. So it's, it, there's constantly uh, things like that. I, I've been working for The Walking Dead, the TV show The Walking Dead. I, I, I've done some writing Saw on that. On that awesome. And, 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 a, and a spinoff show, Walking Dead World Beyond. Um, so I've been, I've been fairly busy doing that, but I think, uh, you know, we're, we're always interested in getting new projects going. We love hey. like horror, horror and kind of genre pieces are what Maddie and I love. And so that like, that's what we are interested in doing and pursuing. I'll tell you what you, uh, you want to see some people down South get all upset. Uh, you just, you just mentioned about them killing off Carl. Okay. <sighs> You'll see them do a full 180. You'll go from having apple pie in your windowsill to a double barrel in your mouth. Okay? I've been there. I, I've been there. I've been there. Georgia, where they filmed The Walking Dead, you know, we, we would go to cover our episodes. So, uh, yeah. Why'd yeah, they yeah. kill Carl, man? Come on. Why'd they kill Carl, man? <laughs> that kid, like. So you were fine with the whole, like, uh you know the glenn thing and that that season cliffhanger and the return like you were okay that you were still on board yeah okay so it was it, but it was the carl thing where you're like that that's not yeah me. basically i i have a buddy who makes t-shirts and i literally had it like he had one drawn up that said if carl dies we riot And I told him, I was like, dude, you need to sell those fucking things. Would it be in, in advance of Carl dying? Yeah. Oh, he made it happen. I'm just, I'm just imagining like a Black Lives Matter riot where they look over and see another riot, <laughs> but it's for killing Carl on The Walking Dead. And, uh, you know, then there's Buzz Lightyear in the background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's other people protesting the live action uh, Buzz Lightyear movie. Right, it's all movie. Uh, Milo, Mr. Milo, what do you got working on there, man, besides those uh, awesome cuff jeans? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, these took a lot of work, these jeans. Um, Where I, you at it, man, in the mountains? I, it could be. Could, I mean, this is a Lockwood home that I'm currently in. It's extremely cold because they were built in like the 70s in New Zealand. And in the 70s, they're like, ah, you guys don't need insulation. We're, we're yes. Kiwis. Go on. Also, What's fun, the, uh, fun fact, it's winter in New Zealand where Milo yeah. is. Little winter. geography, little geography uh, trivia. How about that? Who, who knew? Right. I didn't, that, that's I didn't the reason why I'm in short sleeves and he's in a sweater. Yeah, I didn't believe it till I actually went there, but that, it does work that way. Wow. <laughs> Okay. It, it, Milo, it does look like you're stuck in a cupboard somewhere. Right. Like, or like Harry Potter, where the Dursleys made Harry Potter sleep. Like, that looks like your room right now. Like That's kind of, I mean, that's not far off, any Not far off. Um, I, well, during, we had lockdown here in 2020, and I understand uh, you, yours went on a bit longer than ours. But uh, yeah, our, yeah, but you know, still, we kept going. Ours is still going on in California. During that, we, me and my partner Ella made a, uh, a series, a little web series, which was about a sidekick interviewing heroes. He's trying to find a new hero. And so he's doing Zoom interviews, trying to find a new hero. And we just did pretty short episodes of that. Uh, we did 16. And so now at the moment, we're currently writing a longer form uh, kind of first season of that. Uh, which is exciting because I have never written anything before. And uh, I actually, Eddie and Maddie don't know it yet, but I'm going to come to them with lots of questions soon uh, and lots of drafts. Of Once again, it's all about keeping that inner circle tight, tight. <laughs> is, Got that to. Ser is, is that series on YouTube, Milo? How would, pe no, how, would people, how would people find it? It's only on Instagram. And I think it's could they search for it? How do you Yeah, you can search like it's, sidekick. It's, it's really everybody fun. just just email me your uh Instagram tag and all that stuff for it. And I'll put that yeah, in the yeah, show yeah. notes. It's worth it's, it's worth fun. watching if people can find it. It's really funny. Um so that I'm doing a little bit of work with that. I uh I've recently finished uh, another web series, um kind of like an office style mockumentary about a radio talkback host uh and i was just kind of in the uh, i was in the office kind of one of his support team members but kind of like a useless uh employee who kind of does nothing 
Um, and so that's hopefully going for a second season. And also, I just recently, uh, I haven't done any theatre for a long time, but just recently started a devising process for a big ensemble show of about 13 people. And the only idea we have at the moment is it's going to be set in medieval times. But that's about as far as we've gone. Man. Speaking of medieval times, have you ever seen The Cable Guy? Oh, With yeah. With Jim sure. Carrey? Sure, sure. It's a great scene when they're at medieval yeah. times. And the, the, the spot where he goes, uh, can I get a knife and fork? And he's like, hey, you know, there was, you know, they, they didn't have that medieval times. He's like, but they had Pepsi. And she's like, dude, I got a lot of tables. <laughs> the Cable Guy, everybody. The most underrated Jim Carrey film ever, I think. Was that Janine, Janine Garofalo as the waitress? <laughs> yes. How could I pull that yeah. name out? You don't, know Tim, you don't know Tim Curry. You don't know Tim Curry. I don't know how they convinced Matthew Broderick to do that movie. All right, listen, you're going to be yeah. working with Jim Carrey. One of the scenes is he's putting chicken carcass on his face, and we need you to play straight, okay? <laughs> and we're going to pay him. We're going to pay him like $20 million. Way more money. <laughs> Way more. And then, like, Ben Ben Stiller, like, wrote and directed this movie, I think. Yeah. And uh, which is, which is funny. And then, like, he plays – these twin brothers who are on trial, which is kind of like the OJ thing. Oh, that that's was going right. On at the I, time. Forgot, I forgot about God, that. Or, dude. Or it, was, it was like the Menendez brothers. Yeah. 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 Take off on the Menendez brothers. Yeah. I, didn't <laughs> I, for, I totally forgot about that. They had like all the MTV footage with like Kurt Loader and all that stuff loaded into there, man. God. Cable and guy. It, and wasn't it also Jack Black as, as, yes. uh, as the buddy. Yeah. On the like basketball friend. team. Yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah. young, like a pretty young Jack Black. Wasn't Judd Apatow involved in it somehow i feel like i read something about John Epitaph man maybe because it seems like a lot of crossover like people. that seems right i know um what was her name um she played the girl who puked in the car on steve carell and 40 year old virgin i can't never remember her name leslie man leslie man she was in it she played robin amazing oh really yeah, dude. Cable guy. We got off the cable guy, man. That's how far deep we went. Okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll end with Miss Madeline. Miss Madeline, what do you got working on? What do you got cooking? I feel like I, I wish I hadn't gone after Eddie and Milo. Eddie is on Walking Dead. Milo's <laughs> done like 12 different things he's working on. Uh, mostly, I've just been writing cartoons <laughs> to make a buck. <laughs> Madeline's like, I got this Buzz Lightyear origin story I'm working on. <laughs> No, really. I mean, for the future, what I'd really like, what Eddie and I talk about still, you know, our next movie, right? What is the next thing we're going to do? And like, we really want to do something. I mean, we've already done horror, but we want to keep doing genre stuff. That's the stuff we like, you know, so uh, maybe sci-fi, but who's got that kind of money? And it would be nice to get somebody else to pay for it. So that's right. the big one. That's the big hope. Man, I'm pulling for you because if you guys can take what you guys did with Blood Punch and put it into any genre, I'll be I'll be stoked to watch for sure and stoked to promote. Um, Do you have any money to give us? Yeah, he has all his money from getting shot in the nuts with the paintballs. <laughs> That's it's okay. It, it's okay. We'll just you put invest, out our Halloween that. version of Elf on a Shelf. You know what? I blew I blew all my mad money today on um. It, so I'm gonna do a quick plug real quick. If you're ever in Nashville, Tennessee. You want to get off exit 199 off of exit 40 headed west towards Memphis. Okay. You want to stop at a little place called McKay's used books. McKay's used books. Yeah. McKay's. Um, I go there probably once a week to get DVDs, Blu-rays, books, whatever. And uh, picked up a few titles today. I'll just tell you what I got. I got Fargo. Nice. Fargo. I'm going to revisit Fargo. Uh, anybody ever seen this? Mystic River, Clint Eastwood film. Sure, sure. Never saw it. Checking it out. Some good, some good Boston accents in that one. Dude, 25 <laughs> cents for this. Eddie's in Boston and from Boston, so that's how he knows that. A little Django Unchained. Oh, love right. Django Unchained. So I watched, um, I watched Carlito's Way for the first time the other day. You guys remember Carlito's Way? I did Carlito's Way. God, incredible. Lo I love that movie, man. So I'm uh, 
I got Scarface. I'm going to revisit Scarface. Another Brian De Palma film. Uh, in Carlito's way, that 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 early seeing the shootout with the pool table. God, uh, the tension in that. Like, talk about an underrated like like cinematic shootout scene. Like the tension in that when he's setting up the trick shot. Yes. And uh, the dude and seeing the, in the dude's sunglasses, like like an amazing moment. Like 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 incredible. Who thinks? What what kind of mind thinks of that? incredible scene speaking of brian de palma the untouchables never seen it oh, oh you've never see seen it. it it's amazing if you put it in i'll we'll watch it with you right now <laughs> so i guess that's the one i should start with Here first the lesson just uh, remember that you're line. in for a treat man that is untouchable is great seven seven i this is a big this is actually a this is gonna this is a big argument between maddie and i uh she she hates seven i love it not because it's bad. It's a very good film. I argue that the ending is unrealistic <laughs> and doesn't it doesn't have the impact. I don't want to give it away though. If you haven't seen it, Spoiler. oh, I've seen it. Oh, okay. What I don't remember seeing is uh, Chris Nolan's uh, Inception. Uh, okay. So for a buck, I picked it up. Just uh, don't watch. Just don't go see Tenet. Whatever. Have you, you, have, you seen, have you seen Tenet by any chance? <laughs> no, I have not. Okay, we'll have to have a separate. We have to schedule. Oh. We'll have to schedule another episode once you've seen. <laughs> gotcha. And, 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 and. Um, so here's the thing, guys. If you're ever in Nashville, Tennessee, stop at McKay's. I picked up uh, seven titles for five bucks. So just add to that old physical media collection. Um, so you prefer the physical media to like the streaming stuff? Hell like, yeah, all day long. I'll tell any, you why, brother. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, why? I'm not a conspiracy theorist by any means. We kind of are, so, but go ahead. Yeah. And I'm not like, think the government, I'm not one to always say the government's out to get us or. Oh, but they are. Sure, sure. YouTube satisfy. You, okay. <laughs> now, you can, now you can say, but. I, but, but <laughs> I 100% believe that if everything went to digital streaming format only, it would be one more way for them to censor what we see um which we've already seen in examples of um disney plus they cut the scene of my they cut the whole episode from like season three of the simpsons where homer goes into the uh, insane asylum and the big tall white guy thinks he's michael jackson they cut that episode for whatever reason um so so you would have had to have that on DVD to be able to watch that. Correct, which I have. Um, and that's the big thing, you know. I so they kick your door in and take it. Well, you know, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. They're going to have a hard enough time coming from my guns. So, <laughs> oh, tell us all about your guns because we're in the market. Well, you know, <laughs> I've, got this, else I've got this back here, right? Are they real guns or fantasy fun guns? Uh, they're real. Okay. Uh, so you back here, you can't ask him all of his security stuff, Matt. No, I, I, I right. away, like I he's going to keep that stuff secret. My dog's first name is Roman, and you know, my birthday. Uh, no, um, no, but I, that's. I mean, if I was a conspiracy theorist or really thought of that, I mean, that's my that's my whole. But big I see thing. your point is you're afraid that at some point these things w might not be available, and then and then what? Correct. Now I'm not. I, I don't go super crazy. Like I don't have like uh, all the seasons of Mama's Family or anything like that you know well that stuff just takes up too much space you know you gotta uh, there's, someone, there's, there's somebody else with like another youtube channel who's got that covered so like, <laughs> right exactly so you guys can all get together and you'll have all our bases covered we'll have streaming layout. we'll just do streaming parties of our yeah. physical media They'll, that person and we'll just aim the family, camera the, the golden TV. girls yeah exactly right well guys um we're coming to the end of our little chat here I and mean, thank you once again so much for being on here um this is our tony robbins uh soapbox segment that i told you guys about we're going to go around and basically if you could give some advice to up-and-coming filmmakers or writers actors just what would you say to them and we'll start with mr milo okay so you've decided that you would like to be an actor great great can i say congratulations welcome uh, I 
I heard it. I heard a saying once that whenever someone's giving you advice, they're really just talking to themselves ten years ago, and I think I agree with that. And so I would say the most helpful thing for me uh, is <laughs> the willingness to be really bad and to accept that you're not going to like what you do for a while. You're not going to like your performances and to just find something about acting that you enjoy. So if, if it's a play or whatever you're doing, even if it's a little thing that you've created, find that little nugget of joy for yourself and keep chasing that. Uh, and hopefully in time, your skills catch up to your sense of where you want them to be. Love it. <laughs> no, that was great, man. That was great. I love that phrase that, you know, when someone gives advice, they're basically talking to themselves from 10 years ago. That's or giving them advice from 10 years ago. That's awesome, man. Um, Eddie, what do you got? You know, I would, I would, I would echo a similar sentiment as Milo of just, of just saying, you know, don't, you don't be afraid of, of failing or don't, you know, don't be afraid of doing something and having it fail like like there's no other way to get to where you want to be than to than to fail and and have it not work and then have to have to roll your sleeves up and figure out like i think milo said even if it like you know the like the first draft of blood punch was an embarrassment you know it was an embarrassment and you know i think a lot of a lot of times people stop there but i think if you if you kind of follow what milo suggested which is like remind yourself, what did you love about it? What excited you about it to begin with? Or what was it that made you want to write it in the first place? And kind of rediscovering that, that that's, you know, that can then help you, you can use that as a guide to, to do rewrites or, you know, even the, the first rough cut of the movie itself was, 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 you know, was seemed kind of, kind of a disaster. And, it, and, and, you know, I think Maddie and I went through the same process of like trying to remember like, no, no, we know there's something in here we love let's let's get back let's let's work on you know we have to do some reshoots or whatever but let's try to rediscover that and use that as a guide uh to to get us through so i i kind of just echo what milo said don't, yeah don't be afraid to fail and remember it, it, it's it's weird it's like there's something about the process of filmmaking that almost is designed to beat out of you the one thing that you want to get across which is that pure kind of passion or love you have for something and the process really does test you as far as just beating you down and making you feel hopeless and doing everything it can to extinguish that one like spark of something you really care about. But if you can keep it lit, uh, like I think you can use it as a guide to get you to where you want to get to. 100% correct. I can agree with that. Miss Maddie? What Eddie and Milo said all right that wraps up uh, episode 12 no come on miss maddie you got something besides uh, that i will just to, okay i'll just expand a little bit more i know we're talking about people who are like essentially is for young people advice right uh, somebody but, 60 years old want to be an actor i want to be a writer anybody uh all right what eddie and milo said yes also particularly this is specific to directing it's just something that i've noticed that i feel like is just gone to hell as far as feature films these days learn if you want to be a director you need to learn about story actual storytelling because i feel like this is becoming a lost art to be honest uh okay i gotta stop you right there one film that was directed that you would put on a pedestal and maybe one film that people think is really good that was not directed very well oh god this this is a memory thing again, right? Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna st stick to the same uh, whole series. All right, let's let's look at Empire Strikes Back first. Let's go to Star Wars. Okay. And then any of the Disney pre sequels are terrible. And these are all directors that don't know any how to. I mean, and Ryan Johnson, who wrote his own 
for I don't know if you I assume you know all the names of these movies, these Star Wars sequels, because yeah. you have an R2D2 behind you. But uh Last Jedi is the most tone deaf thing I've ever seen. And I just feel like it's like directors now, they just hire them. They don't it's not like uh like a Tarantino. He knows story, he writes his own stories. I think that's a key to being a good director is knowing story. And I was a writer, Eddie's Eddie is a writer, I'm still a writer. But I think that understanding story is, you know, it's all about the damn story. <laughs> so right. it's director is the visual part, but to be a great director, you need to know story and why it's satisfying, why your story is satisfying to an audience. It's well, the, okay. Why is it satisfying? That's going to be something I take down for sure. Um, because you know, I try to write, you know, I love film horror, especially, but I love all film. And it's like, why is, you know, oh, let's just think of a movie that, you know, assuming everybody likes, um, how about, I don't know, name a, a psycho. We'll say psycho. Alfred Hitchcock, Psycho. Why? Why is Psycho satisfying? What well, tells a really great story? It, he tells a story, um, all the way to the end, and then makes that story really jump out at you at the very end. Um, I th I would I would argue that Psycho also sticks with you because it's you know a movie that starts out from the POV of a character that gets the audience invested and then suddenly kills that character off and leaves the audience. Like, I, I can only imagine what it must have been like for an audience seeing that in like 1960. Right, it's like, what to now? Be to be invested in this character, she's embezzling money and she's on the run and you're kind of starting to care about her. And then she just gets sliced up by some madman in a shower, like halfway through the movie. And you're just left with nothing. Like you're, as the audience, you have nothing else like to cling on to. And then it switches to like her sister trying to find her and you kind of get invested in that. But for that, that moment in the middle of the movie, it was like incredibly daring to just do that and just be like, hey, we're just leaving the audience hanging out to dry on as I far think, as we're to do. I think with this, I think with this episode, I'm going to start something new and then we're going to close. Okay. Um, it's really easy. Uh, just everybody go around and say something that you like that you watched recently. Something that we need to check out. Uh, 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 sorry, my cat's walking all over this keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. JC's dog keeps popping up. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Something watched, that we yeah. saw recently, huh? Yeah, I watched, um, because I've been sick, I actually slammed like four movies in a row. Um, and I, I chose titles that I had not watched yet. Um probably gonna say them and you're gonna be like what you never saw what um carlito's way we mentioned that uh milk the story about harvey milk with sean penn yeah so i had a twofer for sean penn uh primal primal i think, primal I, think fear. A, I think sean penn's in mystic river also so you're gonna be able to yeah keep he that is going. yeah you're gonna oh, be able to keep that going trifecta awesome <laughs> uh primal fear with richard gear Oh uh, yeah, with Edward Norton. That was Edward then, Norton. That was Edward Norton's like big star. Kind yes! Of oh my God, Edward Norton was fantastic in this movie. That was the one they sent his audition tape around, and it kind of made him, like, yeah, made him yeah. famous because he played the the like church boy, the like choir boy. And yeah, the altar like, boy. Yeah, hundred percent with, with the split personality. And That's then right. la uh, last night, or not before last, I watched uh, American Gangster for the first time with Denzel. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Wow, that was yeah. great. What about you guys? What do you What have you seen recently? Nothing. Well, bunch no, of enough, <laughs> I, I started watching this and, I, and it's it's kind of a, a cheaty thing because I was like, hey, this is like Blood Punch. What the hell? Uh, <laughs> but I recently saw, I think it's called Palm Springs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Andy Samberg. And I was like, it's this it's a similar kind of Groundhog Day type thing. But there were it, there were echoes of Blood Punch. How about that? Maddie? It's funny because when I saw Palm, I saw Palm Springs too, but it was interesting watching it. And I just saw like, okay, so this is how they handled 
Yeah. The thing that right. we had to handle it, in blood it, punch it, and it was just like true. an exercise in that, right? It's true. You can see they were faced with some of the same yeah, challenges exactly. and some of the same like like things. So that was that was interesting. What about you, Eddie? Anything that pops out that you watched yeah. recently? You know, I'll throw it out just because it, it, it wasn't made all that recently, but we wa watched it recently. Is a movie called The Dirties, and uh, it's sort of like a documentary movie, but it's about it's 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 easily the best school shooting movie ever made. It's kind of found footage, isn't it? Pretty much. Well, the, yeah, or or fake kind of documentary. It's it's about two kids making a movie, and their footage is what comprises sort of the movie, but it kind of tells a story about kids being being bullied and sort of kind of building up to a possibly a school shooting or that kind of situation. But it's easily the best movie of tackling that subject uh, ever made. And it's like, I don't think, you know, it's it's a thing where I don't think people have heard of it or seem familiar with it. And it's it's an amazing movie. I, I'm totally blanking on uh, the name of the guy who, who did it. Um, he also did a movie called Operation Avalanche more recently, which was about uh, a similar kind of docudrama thing about the, fa the faking of the moon landing. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking oh, about. So it's his first, it, it was this guy's first movie that he did, a movie called The Dirties. I, I highly, I, I'd recommend Operation Avalanche also, but like The Dirties, uh, people, I feel like nobody's heard of and pe people don't know about it. And it's, it's great. Well, guys, we'll end on that note. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our segment on Bre uh, Bremen Horrors Behind the Horror. I'm so glad we got to plug Blood Punch. And actually, I'm really glad we just got to talk cinema and talk some movies, you know, um, had a few laughs, had a good beer. Um, I'm thankful. Um, obviously, our goal is to promote Blood Punch and bring it back to light. I know you guys did it in 2015 and, you know, we're just talking about it now on our channel. But, you know, what's crazy, and you're guys are going to hate me, but in the same section that I found these films in McKay's big, it's a big ass bin and they're all like $2 or under. There was a copy of blood punch probably six months ago. I remember the time I remember cause I saw the cover art and I remember picking it up and like, I bet that's no good. And I put it back. <laughs> I swear I did. I swear I did. And I was going to cut because I already had a stack and I was like, oh, I don't want to take the chance. I don't want to take the chance. I'm going to put it back. What was the price tag on it? Just out of curiosity. Say, what, yeah. it, what did they what want? What, like how little was it? It was, well, they sell used in this bin. So it was used for a buck 95. Well, if it was the same bin as Untouchables, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Right, I, exactly. I, and, and you probably made the right choice if that were the case. Like, I, well, I mean, I love Love Punch. Well, damn, like, now I want the damn. The same uh, price. I want the damn physical copy of Blood Punch, <laughs> you know. So, give anyway, us your address. We'll send it to you. Yeah, we can. We can make that happen. Oh, okay. Let's do that. I will definitely uh, uh, in that same email thread throw you a little address. Send a copy of that. That'd be awesome. But thank you. But thank you uh, so much for having us on. And it's like I have to say, like in doing Blood Punch, our bet, our, our like our most fun experience was taking it to the horror specific festivals, yeah. like the smaller festivals, I, like by far well, like new orleans was great and, and the and the smartest audiences were the horror audiences and it's like so like in some ways that was like the epit that was our proudest kind of moment is when that audience seemed to kind of embrace it and responded to it it, it was the way we always like dreamed an audience would respond but they like very specifically the, the horror the proud kind of horror fans were the ones that 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 that, that were the, the the best part of like releasing or showing the film to the public what or the, and it or might just and honestly it might just be because they're willing to watch any piece of crap that's horror yeah uh, like the, you know, know, their you expectations see, you know, are low and then but, you're when but, you but do we better made, than their expectations you just before we made them. blood punch like i went through bins exactly like the ones you yeah. were describing and i would pick out movies and it was it was it was trying to learn about low budget you know and and you can learn a lot from terror so even if you get one that's terrible you can learn Sports. a lot from yes. Are you uh, are you guys familiar exactly with Criterion right. Collection? Oh, oh yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely. So the very top shelf up here is nothing but uh, Criterion films, and I love how you know their kind of moniker is like film school in a box. You know, you get the essays, and that's another reason why I collect physical media because of how well they put that out. Um, 
another shameless plug. They're fifty percent off right now at Barnes and Noble. Everybody, I'm sure everybody knows <laughs> any, any Criterion. You know, I think I think this this isn't going to interest you as much, but the I think the Criterion has some streaming channel or something. They do. Now too. They do. Do they do they offer they the do. whole library on the streaming? Thing? They do not. Yeah, see, that's they got to keep thing. people going into the stores. Those brick and mortars got to stay open. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank Excellent you. Excellent talking film thank with you. you. Thanks, Everybody be safe, and we hope to see you again. All right, take care. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.